institution, yeah? Um, and uh, some of you may, uh, and I'm not sure, Carl, are you teaching your students to, to build their hardware, software instruments, or are they taking what's available in the market? And I think, again, when Daniel raised the issue of market or tools like the we, yeah, how are they incorporated into creative practice, and what awareness uh, uh, do the um, practitioners have in regard to other dimensions of these objects and the way they are refracted or discussed or discussable in culture, for example, through terms of gender yeah, or race or a cultural location because, um, and again, this is a specific book, then I'll stop, uh, Julian Enriquez, who could not attend, writes from a position of a uh, Jamaican born uh, practitioner, filmmaker, who wanted to specifically look at reggae as it is practiced by the people and by the musicians who set up their sound systems on the street and then there are people dancing uh, with this music. Yeah? And uh, that's when he coined the term sonic body because he says the body, phenomenologically speaking, is always involved. Yeah? And you already addressed the issue of mirroring and kinest kinesthetic empathy. So we have uh, uh, quite a rich palette now, ending with Jane's comment on the breath as a gesture to discuss. I open the floor. Um, I, I, I have a, a sort of, I guess, I, well, I've got one very specific question for, for Jane, but I might come back, I might just ask you later. <laughs> um, uh, I've got a more general question, which is just to sort of, you know, re reflect on uh, the, um, the, f the fact that um, it is perhaps the, um, uh, the pervasiveness of, of technologies that has, has um, dialectically, as it were, led us to reflect back on embodiment in some sense. And I'm just one, w w I just want to ask, um, uh, uh, why do we have to be concerned about uh, this? I'm thinking in terms of uh, Nick and his laptop performers. Is then, wh why, why are we concerned about the disembodiment of these modes of production? Oh well, uh, <laughs> if I could say something, um, I, I wrote back in 2003 when there was a special issue on laptop music, uh, I said that, well, surely we just will get used to it, we shouldn't worry about it. Um, but it seems that every single year there's another article, another person starts to worry, are they just checking their email? And nobody really takes the time to close their eyes. Um, so it just does seem to be a really recurrent issue. Um, um, to, to just get anxious about the sight of these laptop performers being too focused in. Um. I suppose my question is why do you think that is the... Mm. And how many not just you? Mm. You're asking why, why people are, are worried about this particular form of performance? Yes, I mean I've got some thoughts but I'm interested to just to, to, mm -hmm. to Put, put that as a question. I mean, and that's, that's in relation not just to the question of, of, of people b behind their laptops, but, but the, the re-embodiment of the technological gesture. If I can so. interject, you know, we had a, 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 an interesting visitor the other week, Leaf Cutter. Leaf Cutter talked to the music school and, um, and he spoke about laptop performance and I then recalled my first, my first encounter with an uh, uh, artist from Berlin, Ovo, in Houston, and he performed for two hours in, a, in an underground club and never once looked up. And I said, Leif Kader, how is it possible that he would not engage with and said, well, he's just a weird guy, he said, and uh, he just likes to be concentrated on his music, yeah? Uh, but he was so, in a way, not present that uh, it became interesting to me, yeah? That he would refuse to even acknowledge the presence of the audience but was extremely doing extremely complex things, yeah, it appeared. So
So I don't know what, what, the, what the performative attitude is of that kind of performance. I don't know. It's peculiar. Yeah, the um, top lap organization for live coding in its manifesto uh, suggested that everybody should be at least projecting their screens so there wouldn't be a totally hidden instrument. <laughs> which has worked in some settings, people, uh, it, it seems often that the, the hardcore programmers uh, reject more the projection of the screens than a general lay audience. Mm -hmm. The lay audience just likes to know that there is an appropriate activity going on, um, whereas the programmers obsess over why is that semicolon there and not there. And I don't know, the musicians among you, I mean, I don't know whether a laptop performance then could be seen as a critique of the uh, over-exuberant uh, fetishization of uh, versatility of the instrumentalist, yeah, or the conductor, who is uh, in a sort of hyper-expressive mode, whereas I think this is sort of a sub-expressive mode. And last night in the Sonic Ensemble concert, I did notice it was a very horizontal atmosphere. In other words, all the performers were seated at tables like we were. And I think only one vocalist, Jennifer Walsh, and then Eleanor stood up at one point. And the singer, the young singer Eleanor, stood almost motionless, center foot, almost motionless. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas uh, Jennifer was doing more, she actually, she actually engaged her, her, her reverberational skeleton into the performance and you know, was touching her lips when she was singing. But Eleanor stood really just motionlessly uh, processing her voice. And uh, again, it's interesting to see these different approaches. I think it's... Uh, quite bizarre at the moment. There should be such an um, anxiety about that form of performance when we're usually quite happy to see somebody absolutely um, engrossed in playing a cello or, or singing and that there's a real heritage of performance whose performance is quite solipsistic and just seems to kind of um, be about them and their instrument and their music. I also think that um, this kind of mistrust uh, it comes across to the performances that we're looking at as well. We're talking about whether well, that gesture actually doing that or not. And um, I think that's fascinating and I enjoy that. But um, I think it's interesting that it should be such a site of anxiety within performance. Of course. I mean, what I find interesting is that, you know, that people are, um, that I mean, you call it anxiety now, about. Um, you know, that there is no touch, there is no, uh, you know, communication in terms of, you know, uh, gestures uh, so much with uh, interactive music sometimes. But it's equally the case with, with, you know, instruments, you know, classical instruments. There's a whole history of disembodiment and losing sort of, and showing as if it's all very easy to play a, a musical instrument and taking away the body out of it. And there is no discussion of that, you know, it's, it seems that it comes uh, at a point when we are dealing with new instruments, instruments that are uh, not immediately seen as musical instruments, that we have all, all of a sudden this anxiety, but actually there is no need to it. Maybe it has to do also in social terms of the fact that these instruments are not consolidated yet as instruments, and that they're only custom-based. I mean, I, I, I like the, the idea of durable uh, musical partners or agents, you know, that, that in time these instruments will also consolidate as, and, and are being perceived as, uh, you know, instruments that can be used and that people can be trained in, uh, because also these uh, performers uh, who are also developers are not trained, they're just training themselves in relation to, you know, uh, the instruments that they, that they make, but there is no, um, it's not being repeated by other performers doing the same. Now with lap, uh, laptop performance, you have that sense of, um, you know, there are more laptop performance. Um, so, you know, hopefully in the future, uh, I hope so, that this, this really becomes an art form that can be enjoyed by the public, that can be also understood by the public. And, and um, you know, that's probably what this, I mean, that would be my idea of why there's this anxiety around these new instruments. Um, I just, sorry, I just want to point out that it's, of course, anxiety or surprise is it's not a point out, perhaps a reminder, it's of course a culturally determined phenomenon. And, 
And uh, you know, like there are, you know, in Japan, we have uh, virtual performers, you know, like, but there are, and I say we as humans, you know, virtual performers that are actually render in real time and people clap and there is no doubt about the relationship with whatever it is there. So, and I think that this discussion about embodiment or disembodiment is a, is a rem rem remains, I would say, of a post-punk uh, uh, utopia, dystopia paradox in which we you know, perhaps fear that there is something about disembodiment with machines and, and uh, agents, but at the same time, uh, I think a much more sophisticated notion of, of intelligent systems or cognitive in, in cognition system takes us to understand that humans have the possibility of imagining their own and feel their own disembodiment. You know, it's part of the whole of religions and you go to church and you see presence and feel it and, and no one <laughs> you know, questions the presence or absence of that. So, and I think it, it, it would be interesting to just, part for me, I would say it's a posture to say there is embodiment. We are embodied creatures, period. Then uh, the epistemology created, for constructed based on that, we have possibilities of render and design systems that are based in hybrid, in hybridicity, you know, like the, we have uh, agents and interfacing agents, because not only the agents, we interface with those artificial agents or machine-based agents. The internet, I would say, is one of the most uh, pervasive right now. And, and I think that, that having that uh, epistemological clear clarity, perhaps, uh, that, that is complex, I'm not saying that it's easy, uh, you know, it will help us to see how humans can even get tangled in their own paradoxical <laughs> imagining of disembodiment and creating performative systems that render that, from the churches to, to last night. In, in terms of what Peter uh, referred to etymologically, gesture, uh, gestus, gestare, do you think agents have a gestural language? Um, uh, how, how do we, because I think when Irene spoke about retention, you are, you are thinking about also the memory that we have of what a gesture might mean or might not mean. And when you ask the question, um, what, what does a gesture mean or what does he do? Can I just again evoke center spot, Cameron? Mm -hmm. uh, Oliver, who sits at, at uh, mm -hmm. town, was doing the Kinect performance last night. Very much reminding me of theremin, yeah? Mm -hmm. The electromagnetic spectrum. And we did see his hands in a ghostly manner on the screen, but uh, we, we didn't know what you did, except we, we, we assumed you were making music with his hands. <laughs> but um, is it a particular kind of gesture being associated with human, or is it, what is it? Actually, for me, it doesn't really matter. Doesn't and as a kind of follow-up to, sorry, what you said about re-embodiment and what you said about disembodiment, I don't see how this concept stems or even processes uh, can be viewed as, as binary opposite to, to embodiment. Actually, I think disembodiment and re-embodiment are embodiment. You know, uh, uh, the, the fact that they are perceived, any kind of process they're going through, either more kind of conceptual, cognitive, affective, or sensory, it is perceived by us and others, our world, which actually phenomenological speaking, are, are made by the same flesh, then it's the same thing, isn't it? I mean, why it needs to be viewed as a binary opposite, I'm not sure about it. I have, I'm very skeptical about, uh, you know, all these dichotomies. For me, it's exactly the same. Yeah, like, what, what I think is, and I, I agree with you, you know, it's like, in a way, perhaps it's a give, you know, we have to assume a given embodiment as in the only way of being in the world, from Merleau-Ponty to all the reflex, uh, you know, cybernetics to Maturana, Varela, and all that. But there is something about our own discussion about those fears of disembodiments that are actually depictions of how we represent ourselves and the future, or even how we, you know, uh, have experience in a Starbucks with coffee and you know, all that belongs, what I've turned to say is that belong to the same epistemology of how we may uh, modify our sensation of embodiments with practices, performances, systems. 
and and that is doesn't imply of course a dichotomy but we tend to feel it and create it and write about it and theorize about it with a dichotomy that I perhaps you know I think it's already a moment to start kind of erasing that <laughs> or, or, or reformulating it with a much more clear uh, definitions of, of what embodiment what do we mean about embodiment it's not the same that performing art was saying 15 years ago or that resisting embodiment yeah. it was it now I think is metaphor and physiology together mm -hmm. it's more post-humanist in a way yeah, yeah I agree and I think the paradox here is that we are more afraid or we're more skeptical of what we are uh, capable of doing uh, and because embodiment is a kind of very broad spectrum of potentiality and corporeality, and that's exactly what makes us um, intimidated by this kind of huge uh, potentiality that we have in front of us, rather than, and, you know, all this catastrophology of what might happen if. Uh, it's more like giving a lot of games to, to a, a child, and, you know, the child can just take them, experiment with them, throw them again, you know, against the, the parents or what can happen. But I think because I'm not sure about all these things about catastrophizing, you know, what might happen and what if. I think it's great that we have all this potentiality in relation to embodiment. And I think, you know. Up here. Nick. Um, you mentioned, Peter, the, uh, the, the idea of patterning uh, when I think we were talking about uh, whether these practices refer to a doing or a, or a, or a meaning. Uh, and then at the end of your presentation, you were asked a question. You said possibly neither. As far as I kind of read your answer, you said possibly neither, but more of a patterning. So I just wanted to pick up on that um, and then offer a different theory of, of, of gesture in, in, in mathematics. Um, Gilles Châtelet speaks of gesture as a pre-semiotic um, actuality. So bef before you create meaning, you have movement. Um, and in a way, gesture is, I, I don't know if it's pre because it gives a kind of linearity to it, but it's, it's outside, before or after, but it's certainly not in the, the, the location of, of gesture is, is not in meaning and possibly not in embodiment, um, but it's in patterning in creating sequences of order that uh, bring about a meaning possibly later. And, uh, and I think the power of the gesture is that um, it, it almost invites a body, but it doesn't have to be embodied. Um, but there's a close kinship between the gesture and the body. Um, I think it's an interesting question of trying to locate the gesture ontologically. Um, but I, I personally feel more, more at home with the notion that it's neither meaning nor doing, but it's, uh, it's a much more fundamental force for ordering of uh, creating sequences, patterns, which can then be read and semiotically organized. Um, and I think a, a, a very interesting perception of this is in actually Narto in his writings on, uh, on the, the, the Mexican desert. Um, when he's sort of 30 days without opium and he's suffering from a like serious withdrawal syndrome and, and his perception of the desert is intensified by this sensation and what he says is that the whole desert is a collection of signatures, of signs, of patterns that he can't really uh, put together into, into meaning but there is in that, uh, in those signatures, crosses, lines, a sort of um, a proto-body or, a, or a, an emergence of a body, an emergence of a meaning, which he probes throughout this, this writing. Uh, he comes to the conclusion that uh, there is no way of giving it word, of giving it meaning uh, as a sort of fixed object. And I think that lack of fixity in the gesture is, is, gives it its power as a symbol, as a symbolic language, uh, which is why it's also very operative in mathematics uh, as well as natural language. So I just wanted to propose that sort of um, dislocation of gestures, neither be meaning nor, nor, uh, nor doing. Yeah, I mean, 
terms of our talk. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think it also co uh, comes back to the issue of how we read, how we see things, also in the, in the theatre, I mean, the kind of theatre that Arthur was looking for in his bigger artistic project, you know, to, go, to come to terms with and also to break the, the Western or the Occidental uh, culture um, through theatre. Um, his images that he produces, also bodily images, but music images, and you mentioned uh, the radio piece, well, I which you wanted to um, it's, I think the images that he produces are gestures mm -hmm. and it's exactly what you're trying to describe what Arto is doing I think as well um, you could read it metaphorically or symbolically as you say but they are m much more also embodied always, they are always um, somehow before meaning and it's more of a, as you say an invitation to, to create meaning um, I think some people and I think Arto himself refers to hieroglyphs, you know, mm -hmm. the, the reading of hieroglyphs that are um, in a way um, semantically like th there are patterns there. They are um, sedimented through time, and we we can we can re uh, uh, read them, but we can also feel them. They are textured. We can we can uh, relate to them in, in an embodied way. So I think um, I'm not quite sure to say that gesture is before meaning. This is I mean, yeah, also no, I, I, yourself. I, so yeah, yeah. So um, I think it is. It's definitely part of the, the basis how we produce meaning and how we create social contact. So it's 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 maybe not even pre, but more hyper sort of <laughs> in that sense. It's 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 there as the basis. Um, and um, so I just yeah. mentioned that as a way of proposing a different dichotomy. That's not meaning or no. doing, yeah. but it's it's a much more ongoing, continuous process between these and outside of these. And yeah. and, and gesture has the power to mobilize that. That, that flexibility of doing and meaning, yeah. because in my opinion, it's, it's neither. Uh, so it's, it's maybe para, it's outside this, and uh, it mobilizes meaning and mobilizes a, a doing w without possibly being either. Um. And I, I wonder in, in work science, uh, so if you think about Taylorism and, and Fordism, whether the engineers that were studying motion we're looking for patterns or uh, durability or duration and, and, and I guess uh, how to optimize the machine yeah, of workers and uh, not so much what, what this means but how it can be made more efficient um, which brings us perhaps to some extent again in the realm of the artificial system building yeah, that you were trying to teach and train fascinating. Um, any comments <laughs> on the artificial systems or what was just mentioned here? And I'm, I do look forward this afternoon in the second round table. We have actually two panelists, um, Nicolas uh, Salazar, Sutil, and Jay Murphy, who will bring some uh, attention back to our tour and forward. Yeah? And etymologically, if we have a literary scholar here, hieroglyphics, were they related to the figural or to simply things we could not read? That, or is it is hieroglyph, is it a drawing? Hi, well, I suspect Hi, Hi, might come from sacred? Sa no? sa sacred symbolic science know. that we cannot clearly read or? It, yeah. Kind of finished now. <laughs> yeah, but just saying that the you know to interpret in a metaphoric or symbolic thing would be the most radically anti-orto sorts mm -hmm. of he's yeah. so radically against interpretation. These forms are as real as anything can possibly be. be. I mean, and that's the sense of at least the early orto in terms of hieroglyphs. These are things that I, these are forces that move the universe that actually exist, right? The sort of sacred geometry. Um, 
but any sense of metaphor is, uh, is really stomping on that idea. So. Thank you. Could I, I'd like to say something that I think what Nick was talking about. Carl, and I'll even try to get the microphone, because I don't. Is it fun? Testing, testing. Hi, Nick, the, the thing that you were talking about, well, the, the thing that you alluded to, actually, was virtuosity. Did you use that word? I didn't use the word. Did you do that on purpose? Um, no, it wasn't any sort of virtuosity. Because one of the things that I find really fascinating, and one of the things that comes up a lot in discussions about laptoppers, is, is, um, is virtuosity. Is there any link between how we play an instrument, the virtuosity involved in playing an instrument, and the virtuosity that's maybe missing from playing uh, the computer. I mean, I have an answer that, I mean, I, uh, there's so many things that we could talk about when, when we're talking about this stuff. But one of the things is, the way you were talking about as well, which was funny for me, 10,000 hours, is that how long it takes to, to learn an instrument? Um, to get to expert level, say, for entry to a conservatoire and violin, that's the figure from music psychology literature. I mean, I've spent more than 10,000 hours on a computer. Yeah. It's well, more. Um, if you, it, so a computer scientist, Norvig, uh, has a, a blog where he did a posting, and he said it's 10 years to get to expertise. And he said for computer programming languages, it's 10 years of work, just like it parallels the musicianship. And that would... Uh, I did a paper as somebody else, as Click Nielsen, back in 2007, where I talked a bit about um, the practice of live coding and how much practice is required. And so I've now been live coding for 10 years. So uh, I'm not going to claim that I'm necessarily expert yet, because the problem is that there isn't a set pedagogy. There isn't a whole tradition that you learn according to. You can make all sorts of, go down all sorts of blind alleys, and you can mislearn things. Um, but um, it is possible that we're starting get to, get to get to a point that there are explicit live coders who have put in their 10,000 hours of live coding practice. Now, skills don't always translate across so well. So even if you practice programming um, uh, just as a sort of office task, as out of real time, it's different when you take it to a concert condition and you've got to avoid um, spilling your drink on yourself while you're performing or whatever. There's other factors that... that uh, other stresses that, that govern that skill. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're right that um, uh, laptopists perhaps are often seen as, as not having practiced enough, <laughs> but we can combat that uh, as time goes on. But I think this is one of, the, one of the reasons we are fascinated by this, one of the reasons that comes up. But most, of the, most of what you guys are talking about, I have no idea what you're saying. None. But just from practicing it, from being involved in it for at least 15 years. Um, the, the, there is this sort of uh, fascination behind what it is that's going on back there, which is new, which is completely new. I mean, you've seen a piano, piano's been around forever. It's still a fascinating instrument. It's an instrument that we can do all kinds of new things with. But, but we know what it is. We've seen it. We've seen people play it. We know when somebody plays it well. We know when somebody plays it badly. But we don't know that about the this new technology, not yet. And we're still learning about it. So there's lots of fascination about it. But embodiment and non-embodiment and all that kind of stuff, I have no idea what that is. One, one of the things that I think is, is very relevant and just very close is that the system, computer systems, digital systems, are very different than notions of traditional instrumentality, just because they create different kinds of contingency between the actions, you know, the interfacing, what we call the interfacing, and the, the human perceived action and the uh, execution and the perceived result. And then it totally obliterates that traditional way of understanding that relationship as performance. The other thing that I will add to your point is that we have to remember, or I would like to remember that it's always a social context going on. We perform with our own friends normally. You know, it becomes 10 years of hanging out with the same people who understand what you're doing. So normally creates a conceptual layer in the perception of the performance that is virtuos, virtuoso in itself. You know, the idea of virtuosity comes very related with entertainment and good, uh, God, and stuff like that. And the, vir you know, the virtue of having that special thing. And we know that it's not a special thing. It's actually a, a shared knowledge of the community that we perform with. No, no, I don't, I don't agree with that. <laughs> I don't agree with the idea of virtuosity. No. Yeah. Well, what do you mean by 
Victor. Being able to play extremely well the piano or being able to like, play. For example, like some jazz people, you know, certain jazz people were not recognized to play really well. It was not music mm. until 15 years. But, but then we discovered that Dizzy Gillespie and that. Um, you know, there is, a, there is a political fact in the, in the definition of virtuosity that is merely social, I think. You know? <laughs> and it's a shared agreement of what we think is intelligent and good. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, uh, Simon Kata. Thank you. Um, I'd like to sort of turn it around and try and make the argument that laptops, laptop performance isn't so different from uh, traditional instrument te instrumental performance. I think that if I mean if you think about it, every instrument has its own kind of gestural language in the way that you play it. I mean, if you saw a tuba player playing a flute in the same manner. Uh, in, in playing his tuba in the same manner that someone would play a flute, you'd think it was pretty funny. Um, and I think that it's basically that we, lap, laptop performance is such a, a new field that we, st we still have uh, to develop the kind of the physical gestural language around the instrument um, to, or, or to end up with some norms around it. Um, I think one of the most disturbing things is seeing um, someone performing with a laptop and trying to apply what they know from maybe they played guitar or something before and they're, they're hitting keys and hands are flying and somehow it's completely unbelievable as a gesture and it, it, it can ruin a performance just seeing this kind of flamboyant stuff, it's not suited. And I, um, it just sort of brings me back to, to something that um, I noticed with, with Nick's presentation, what he was saying. Um, is it seems as if there's very quite there's quite clearly a pervasive humour um, in the algorithms and and um, it seems something that there, I don't know whether I don't know whether you, uh, Nick would like this but I, I, it seemed like there's an invented character of a computer there and there was some some kind of humour being made out of the literalness of of a computer's reactions and I just wondered uh, what I would like to ask Nick is whether he's trying to create um, a performance style for his, uh, his artificial intelligences that is fundamentally computer or is it fundamentally human and, and also then kind of relating back to your algo uh, dubstep uh, comp remix competition then who, who is to judge that um, as well I and mean, is it really computers? Uh, yeah well it would never be denied that human beings wrote the algorithms and the human beings are absolutely in the guts of the machine in particular an act like live coding it's clear that there is a human being in the midst of every decision, in the midst of uh, every uh, changed instruction. Um, humor comes into some of my work. Uh, live coding in particular, a good way to tackle some of these issues is through a little bit of humor, I've found. Um, but I wouldn't say that everything I do is humorous uh, because there's really interesting uh, research goals just in things like machine listening, in trying to make artificial in agents that can learn like human beings. You learn a lot about human musicians through any attempt of that nature. Uh, so, uh, so I'm very happy to acknowledge the, the comment and agree with you entirely that, that humans are involved. <laughs> um, in the algorithmic remix competition, um, I've written the judging panel. I wrote the code for them but they have some autonomy because machine learning is used. But I'm not allowed to say anything till after April 1st about how they were built, sure. because that would destroy the integrity of the competition. <laughs> <laughs> because I can't give you clues that might help you. Can, uh, can you tell people the names of the judges as well? <laughs> uh, well these are, they have humorous names. One is uh, Code Fine. That's a judge that is sort of uh, old school dubstep. And then there's Critex, who's a sort of newer dubstep production. And then there's some um, Judge Rules, who's more sort of an expert on general electronic dance music. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, we, have, we have 10 more minutes. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Is this on? <laughs> oh, yes, it is. Um, it's very interesting that we're talking about computer performance or digital performance now in the tradition of musical instrument performance because that connects back nicely to the very good statement Peter made before that it is interesting that there seems to be this anxiety about the so-called disembodied laptop performer whereas this obsession with disembodied sound 
is of course much, much older. This has always been around in, in uh, classical music making. And this is also the reason why I quit. I was a musician before and I got very bored and upset about it. Um, so I think, I think it's, it's very important to realize that this idea of the disembodied laptop performer, first of all, isn't disembodied, of course, because also has a body, but there's nothing essentially new or different about this digital technology. There's a lot of mystification going around in, in performance studies, I find, ar around digital technology. A lot of it, I think, is because the people that write about it um, don't really know how it works or don't have, I mean, they, no, I mean nobody of course really knows how it work, uh, works, but people who don't have a long experience in working with computers, they don't do the programming themselves. Now, what, what I do find really important here is to acknowledge, and that goes back to what Peter was saying as well, that it is a political choice to make artwork that seeks to draw attention away from the fact that these bodies that make the art are part of our culture, are in the world, and have all kinds of other aspects apart from sound, which has only has formalist or aesthetic qualities. So I would really think, you know, that's a thing that I'm very interested in, that this is actually a choice, that this is a political force that I'm very suspicious of. Not for nothing are most musicians I know, especially classical musicians, uh, very conservative and complicit in the status quo of our society. They literally are the puppetry of the bour bour bourgeoisie, I would often say. I mean, <laughs> to put it in that good old terminology. <laughs> anyway, thank you. <laughs> Follow up on this one? No, but I'd like to say something completely different. Which was, yeah. <laughs> Which has, which has something to do with this, the, yeah, no, Chen, yeah, but the, the idea of, of, of capturing, this is a, a sign, this is, this is a sign. This, this, is probably the, this is probably the least, these are real signs, real capture signs. But no, they're not the representations. Re okay, yeah, the representation, well, it's a trace, it's a it, it is a, it was made a result of sign onto paper, so yeah. I would say it's, it's a representation. It's the result. But uh. this, this is an in-breath and an out-breath in an attempt to create a sign. And how is it done? Blow, blow. Into glass? Yeah. yeah. But you, you can't inhale too <laughs> hot to, so you... <laughs> so it's, it's quite, a da uh, quite a dance we did to create it, but the idea was of the, the patheticness of collapse and the, you the resignation. Yes, mine. You were. Yes, mine. It's quite... Uh, the dynamics of fragility and resilience again. The uh, yes, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the connecting, the, the connection between the psi. And when you're doing something, I think unique. Yeah, uh, nobody else is working in this field. I don't know of anybody specifically at the moment. It's so obsessed. Um, that's that's not the way to get around virtuosity. You can be really. Um, in 10 years, I've been working with this Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, absolutely fascinating, and I, I have no comparison. Uh, what, I, what I do remember, in 10 years ago, when in the dance tech community we became aware of uh, uh, motion capture, I, I remember one visual artist from Denmark um, used um, the data trace the trace forms of the, the choreographic data over, let's say, a certain period of time, let's say one minute, uh, uh, and then uh, I think built uh, a three-dimensional glass structure based on the trace forms. So she, in a sense, uh, uh, made a manifestation of data in another medium. I think she chose a, a glass, uh, um, fiberglass fiber structure which was an abstract artwork, um, however, based on actual motion data. And so this transposition, again, I think is, is very fascinating to me. Um, and it shows up in some uh, research projects like William Forsyth's uh, Synchronous Objects uh, project, where they're using topological representation of movement, uh, looking at it from many different <coughs> angles. Yeah. Um, where data now, is, there is no more uh, clear representational um, image of the dance, but what you see is data of the dance represented in different uh, kinds of uh, figurations. Uh, 
Cordana and then over here, uh, uh, Iron, yeah? Okay, I'll, I'll get back to uh, a little bit of uh, uh, gender, uh, cultural differences, and political in a way, and get back to vir virtuosity, put all, all that somehow together in, in a kind of uh, uh, speculation about the ways that we are actually looking at these things, uh, forgetting about the, the, the differences between generations and, and the ways that gen uh, different generations perceive uh, these new instruments. And the, and the speed that new instruments have been, so-called instruments that we can call instruments uh, for any kind of digitally enabled performances, is so fast, it, it is unprecedented. I mean, if you think about the time that it took to develop a new uh, kind of piano or whichever other instrument, it allowed people time to, uh, Th th they were all uh, uh, rejected at, at the beginning as uh, inadequate and uh, uh, not proper. But then uh, the time the, uh, that people had to get familiarized with them was much, much longer. We don't have that time. We are in a constant ca uh, kind of struggle to catch up with the latest technologies. And it is the development, of the pace of the development of technology that is really accelerating. So I think we are going to have maybe, I don't know, it's just, just a question, are we going to have different theories uh, for different generations? Because different generations will grow up with entirely different ideas about what is body, what is the relationship between body and technology, uh, uh, the, the fluency in technology, that they, 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 they grow up. Uh, it's a kind of putting incredible I think uh, incredible differences between different generations, maybe even much bigger than between different cultures. I don't know, it's just a question. What do you think? <laughs> well, yes and no, because there seems to be, as Danny is also uh, suggesting, uh, again, theories are coming back. I mean, I, I, f I strongly feel the music sociologist, Marxist, almost critique of what you were saying, and these theories have to be, you know, reinterpreted in terms of what are these instruments, these new musical instruments, these technologies doing in a you know, capitalist or post-capitalist uh, you know, society today. Um, and it seems that it's, it's not that much different <laughs> from the critique that was already uh, you know, being said you know, like in the, in the 1940s or 1950s, uh, but for other instruments. I mean, we are, we are just creating new instruments um, that dwell on the same kind of mysticism, the, the kind of, uh, let's say, the, um, the distancing of labor and then musical appreciation. But in, in itself, these principles are very old. So yes, new generations, new instruments come, and the, the speed is, seems to be accelerated. But uh, the, the underlying principles, I, I see that they are still quite similar to you know, theories that have already been produced. So. Let's come back to it and con conclude with one more question, and then lunch is waiting for us, uh, uh, Ian Winter. Uh, I guess I'm not sure if this is a question anymore, but one observation going back to the whole piano idea, which is that we all know what a piano does, whereas for the general audience, I mean, a laptop is, for better or worse, the signifier that you are watching Netflix or checking your email, um, which that's just sort of the, I mean, like, a like a Wii controller, like here's this thing on stage that you're giving this sort of privileged visual state that for better or worse, it has this whole multiplicity of meanings. Um, so I don't know, that's, that's, and I actually do lots of laptop performance kind of things, but that's something I always ponder. It's like, well, yeah, I, I would appear to be checking my email, even though clearly from a performance and expert standpoint, I mean, there's as much information going through your index finger into a trackpad as there is if you were playing the violin. Um, but it would be very different if, say, we're using, was using a breath controller out of you know, some sort of fabric-based sensor so that instead, instead of moving a finger, you were going, I don't know. That's just, that was my little observation at the moment. But I will leave that there. You know.
in co- are, sorry, you are. I'm Kate. Um, I work with Chroma Collective, and I'm um, showing a, a, a heart sensor project uh, at 7:30. Yeah. Um, I guess it, it's something which is linked to uh, this beautiful glass here, which is making making the invisible visible. And you know, I think that is what's so profound about it. And it seems to have this. Um, this kind of performative aspect, because that is what it's doing. And that, to me, links back to the problem with laptop performances, which is, you know, uh, we cannot see, or we do not feel that we are seeing the site where the person who plays the instrument is, uh, is manipulating the instrument. Uh, it is a new instrument, and it, it always worries me as a person who isn't writing code how I am meant to enter into that. And it's not awareness of the technology, it's a wish to, to enter it, to enter into an understanding of it. And as much as watching a, 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 a cellist play a cello, I have this perhaps delusion that I can under, somehow see some of the communication going on there. I cannot see like, how I'm hearing it. I cannot see my ears. I, I cannot see where the movement begins. But I feel that I have something in in the performance. But if the cellist was behind a big silver wall with an apple on it and I could only see her head, I don't think that would be as as exciting as a, a communication. And it is really this, this drive to, to become more involved in the communication rather than a fear of the technology that uh, that really you know, it makes me think, do I have to learn? Do I have to learn code? Do I have to understand how people are writing their algorithms to really understand the, the style that they are, uh, the styles with which they are writing this thing. It's like narratives, you know. I can, I can see a style coming through a particular way of writing, but I cannot see that in code yet. And uh, maybe this just grows as we all become more affair with technology and it, it is learnt in schools. And I wonder how, uh, when first people saw the cello, it must have looked like magic. <laughs> Can I just very quickly say that a cello is not a general computational device? So this <laughs> can do all sorts of different things. It could emulate size or emulate cellos. It, it, so one good cure is to actually project the screen and at least try and show a bit more of what's going on. But yeah, I, I thank you for your plan. <laughs> I would like to thank the audience and our panelists for starting us uh, up. Um, we. Uh, to make just a brief comment on the structure of the day. It's now uh, lunch break and we're serving sandwiches to you all on the upstairs uh, floor in room 103. And in the meantime, the technicians and I will try to prepare this space for BATCO workshop. So Ivana and Srinka invite those of you who'd like to move uh, to get to know uh, their interactive software, whatever dance. Yeah. And um, at the same time, Ian Winters is offering an electronics lab in 003. And upstairs, people who'd like to talk to Carl about uh, programming music uh, questions, he will be in, in a room. And uh, Daniel will set up uh, Arthur Elsinar presenting new work with face. So I think. Uh, from breath to face to the body moving in space here. These are your options this afternoon. We then meet again all here at 5 o'clock for another round table, and then we'll go over for dinner to the hub, while frantically nine shows will be prepared for tonight. <laughs> yeah, six upstairs, three downstairs. Yeah, And that'll be our evening program. So enjoy the day, and thank you very much for the first <laughs>